নন্দিতা দেখতে পাচ্ছিস কিনা একটু বলবি
Hello, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes, you. Yes. Okay. Good. So, a warm welcome to Progress and Prospects in Biology webinar series. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we start, a uh, couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I'd request audience to mute your microphone and do not share your screen during the session. Please turn off your uh, video as well to preserve the bandwidth. Uh, please, please uh, pin the, pin the uh, speaker screen in your Google Meet for uninterrupted visualization of slides. I'd request uh, please refrain yourself from posting any welcome messages in the chat box. Use chat box. Uh, to post your questions and we'll moderate these questions after the talk in the Q&A session. Feedback link to get e-certificates will only be shared at the end of the session and available to participants watching in Google Meet or YouTube. With this note, uh, it's time to introduce today's speaker and today's uh, none other than Professor NRI Banerjee who is also the mentor and convener of this webinar series. So that way, in this sense, this is a special webinar series when we are hosting our uh, beloved uh, mentor and convener of this webinar uh, session. So with this, I'll take a brief, uh, I'll take a time to, to briefly introduce her uh, today. So. Uh, Professor NRI Banerjee is uh, currently based at University of Calcutta. She is currently a professor uh, of, of Department of Zoology. She has received her master's degree in zoology from uh, University of Calcutta, her PhD degree in biotechnology uh, with research on immunobiology carried out with a NET scholarship in, uh, at, at Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata, and her DSc from uh, University of Calcutta too. After teaching under and postgraduate zoology under the University of Calcutta, she did uh, postdoctoral research at the University of Washington, Seattle, USA, and also contributed to, uh, to, to drug discovery uh, in the Indian corporate sector spearheading research to find cures for lung inflammation and degeneration. She started her own laboratory at the Department of Zoology, Kolkata, uh, University of Kol uh, Calcutta, India in uh, 2009, with around 14 years of uh, experience in research. Her research has yielded several patents involving translational outcomes, uh, research in novel antibody engineering, tissue engineering, and technology for developing regenerative strategies for pulmonary and renal de degeneration. Dr. Ray Banerjee has authored several books as sole authors, as well as chapter contributors, uh, contributors to books published by Springer, Macro uh, International and Current Books International. She is also the recipient of a number of prestigious research, travel, and seminar grants. She is on the editorial board of several international journals and is a member of various policymaking committees related to education and research on life sciences. She is also the prime mover of, uh, of an important restoration project of a hundred years old muse museum and repository of rare endangered and threatened zoological uh, specimens because she, she believes the application of technology, archiving of the past while knowing and preserving India's biodiversity through awareness and program is the key to success of any branch of life sciences. So with this, I'd, I'd uh, request today's speaker, Professor NRI Banerjee, to, uh, to, to uh, join us and give the, uh, give, give, give the speak today. So today she will talk about, uh, today she will talk about how does uh, lung detect damage and repair 
after infection, inflammation, and degeneration. So uh, over to you, ma'am. The stage is Thank yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sundaram. Thank you. Uh, I do not know which version Shinjini gave you, but I uh, would have preferred a shorter introduction because you see, every time somebody uses, uh, introduces me, it feels very much like an obituary. So uh, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure uh, to be able to share some of the data. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, that's why I'm on two screens. Uh, so um, I'd uh, better start presenting. But if anything happens, and I think uh, one of the housekeeping uh, advices, uh, Sundaram, uh, today's uh, host, is probably to pin uh, the uh, presentation on everybody's screen, right? Yes. Yeah. Please pin so, it. Please, everyone. Uh, yeah. Right. Everyone should pin it because Google uh, does not allow you uh, allow uh, just the speaker to present the screen. And sometimes, if somebody starts presenting screen by mistake, then um, it's it's kind of a jumble. So, um, uh, a request to everyone: turn off your videos to uh, preserve the uh, bandwidth. Turn off the um, audio. Uh, I'm uh, uh, probably going to with my lecture. Uh, some of my neighbors' children are playing. Uh, so you can hear a little bit of screams. Uh, the AC is making a bit of a noise. And we all are home uh, on a Sunday evening. And today I'm going to share uh, my uh, work, my team's work. And uh, uh, um, it's a work spanning about uh, 17 years now uh, that I was introduced from uh, a training in uh, uh, immunology and information into the lung, allergy, inflammation, degeneration. Uh, although uh, my group does not work directly with infection, but infection has both the components of inflammation and uh, degeneration. So uh, my uh, talk will um, be on, uh, on that. So I will start presenting my screen, but everybody knows that once I start presenting the screen, uh, the speaker becomes totally blind to what is going on. So if at any point, um, you lose me, uh, somebody will have to unmute and tell me that you have lost me. So I'm uh, beginning to um, uh, present the screen and then I'm totally blind to anything else that will be happening henceforth. So I will be speaking on my own. As you know, in digital platform, uh, one does not have the privilege to engage with one's audience. So it's uh, almost like uh, like a mad person, you are sitting in front of a device and uh, you're uh, saying whatever it is that you uh, want to say. So um, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, a word of apology, if uh, I sound a little bit disoriented sometimes, uh, because see, that's, that's the problem. I am not able to uh, that way see you. So in the um, uh, interest of time, I would be dividing, uh, maybe I should also uh, turn off my video because you would probably find it a little bit distracting. Madam is looking here and there, and it is better that you don't have to look at her, look at the presentation. Okay, so um, the uh, talk title uh, is Repairing the Lung. Uh, lessons from uh, inflammation and degeneration. Uh, and uh, this work was partly carried out by uh, my team at the University of Washington, partly at uh, the um, uh, corporate house of the Tatas at Venus Therapeutics. I will be sharing some of the data from there, uh, but not much. Uh, and some from my lab um, in, uh, at the University of Calcutta. So this has been a journey. And while my basic training has been in uh, immunology and inflammation, uh, the lung is a different ball game altogether. So uh, since I know uh, the audience today comprises of both undergraduate students and postgraduate students and pre and postdoctoral researchers and junior and senior and very senior uh, scientists and non-scientist professionals, uh, I would like to keep uh, the uh, tenor of the talk somewhere uh, in between. So I will probably be tra traversing uh, quite a bit, and um, there are a few explanations and definitions that I will be sharing on the way, so that later on when I share the data, it is comprehensible to you. So first off, 
but the uh, first part of the uh, talk will comprise of uh, introduction to the lung. Uh, the second part of the talk will talk about uh, inflammation, the main role players in inflammation, uh, what happens um, uh, when uh, inflammation has to start and uh, stop. Uh, and uh, there is a purpose uh, to try to understand some of the role players because they uh, figure uh, later on as drug discovery targets. Uh, and uh, some of it will also talk about anti-inflammatory um, uh, molecules uh, that I've tried to develop. Uh, we've, we've tried to see through our uh, uh, nutraceutical and other drug discovery uh, platforms. And the third part of the talk will um, um, comprise of uh, the regen uh, regenerative um, um, strategies. How much is it? The um, uh, element of degeneration uh, um, that is um, an unavoidable uh, part of chronic inflammation. So in uh, the lung, um, the different cellular and non-cellular components uh, undergo stress of various kinds uh, to withstand the stress, to uh, eliminate the stress, to address the pathogens and allergens and other substances, pollutants, toxins that enter into the lung, a number of mechanisms are in play. Uh, and one of them is inflammation, uh, which kicks in in the form of innate um, um, uh, parameters, uh, which with no specific uh, aim, um, sort of blinded um, defense mechanism. And uh, the, uh, there is, of course, also a memory directed part. Uh, the um, essence of inflammation is not only to turn on the uh, offensive and defensive me mechanisms, uh, to um, try and preserve the uh, sanctity and integrity of the tissue. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is also an aspect that it should be regulated because if it is not, then uh, it leads to uh, other maladies, including apoptosis and necrosis and degeneration. So that would be the third part of my talk. But the overarching goal of our work is translation. That is, whatever we understand at a very basic level, are uh, the information thereof are taken uh, at a different platform uh, to be made into products and processes for use. Uh, and of course, the generation of knowledge to uh, fill in the gaps. So um, uh, the um, lung uh, developed as a complex um, uh, uh, tissue by which um, to uh, osmoregulate and in land animals for oxygen exchange. Um, and you can see in the picture, and I use the cursor to point at uh, some of the uh, important points that I would like to highlight. So uh, the lungs are the primary organs of uh, the respiratory system. In mammals and most vertebrates, two lungs are located near the backbone on either side of the body. Uh, and as we speak, all of us, we know how important uh, that is. The primary function of the lung is gas exchange, uh, that is um, from the uh, atmosphere to take the oxygen and transfer it to the bloodstream uh, and release carbon dioxide from the bloodstream to the atmosphere. Uh, and here I thank Shinjin, uh, my student, who has made the slide. And you will see all kinds of funky cartoons and this and that, and all that is uh, hard keramoti. So uh, coming back, the lungs also provide airflow that makes vocal sounds um, as I speak. It is important for making speech. Um, and uh, uh, this is an overview of the uh, different um, uh, vertebrate lungs, the amphibian lung, the reptilian lung, and the mammalian lung. However, in the cartoons, uh, these are shown as uh, very homogeneous uh, structures, but it is not. So in the subsequent slides, we will be talking about uh, the cells that comprise the lung, the parenchyma, uh, the uh, spaces in between, um, uh, which are filled with uh, secretions, which are filled with uh, extracellular matrix, um, uh, and there are the air spaces uh, um, which exchange gases from uh, the blood, which is the pulmonary circulation, and uh, that ramifies across the entire lung. So um, this is the um, structure of the lung, the larynx, uh, then the, uh, the trachea, 
uh, and uh, which uh, divides into the two bronchi, uh, which further ramifies into the bronchioles, and the bronchioles end in the termi uh, terminal alveoli. Uh, however, um, the uh, two lungs uh, of the bilaterally symmetrical animal humans uh, are uh, by no means uh, exactly similar, and nor are uh, every part of the lung exactly similar. So uh, in the third part of the talk, when I will be talking about regeneration, uh, we would be, um, I think someone started um, presenting. Uh, whoever started presenting could please stop yeah, presenting. Please. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, Again, to audience, please do not uh, present your slide. Mm. See if I'm visible now. Yeah, you're visible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can I request to audience, please pin it. Yeah, guys, can you pin it in your uh, screen? Um, then this will, will not happen. Um, all right. So um, the the two lungs, uh, the the, uh, the parts of the lung are also uh, not exactly the same. Uh, and what I was saying just before we were interrupted is that during the degeneration process, and your, uh, as well as the inflammation process, as well as the infection process, you will see that the different parts of the lung are attacked differently, colonized by the microbes differently. Allergen presentation happens differently, and so does the degree and the type of inflammation and degeneration. And one of the most important things that we have found through our work is that uh, we, uh, when you want to profile inflammation, uh, it is by no means a homogeneous landscape where everywhere it's the same. It is very, very different, which is why taking the entire lung for uh, the assessment is very important, rather than taking a portion of the lung, which does not give the uh, the exact picture, as well as when we look for stems and niches, we find bias uh, at bronchial alveolar junctions in the alveolar spaces, in the small airways and the large airways. And so this is actually a very, very complex structure. So uh, these are located in the thoracic cavity in the chest um, as part of the lower respiratory tract that begins at the trachea and, and branch into bronchi and bronchioles. And uh, since I will be talking about different diseases, uh, when uh, we talk about different diseases, uh, we also um, talk about uh, the uh, different parts of the lung being affected uh, <coughs> under different conditions. Uh, Sundaram, I think you should mute yourself because I can't hear you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, the different parts of the, uh, too much of distraction, uh, 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 all right, so so this is this is not homogeneous, this is um, different in the different parts, and different parts need to be assessed uh, in that uh, spirit. Uh, here, uh, we need to acknowledge an animal that without which our uh, studies remain uh, incomplete, and as I say in all my classes, and a lot of my students will be here, is that uh, we uh, use uh, mice and other animals for our uh, research, uh, but uh, every time we mu one must have the humility that we are subjecting them to discomfort uh, to understand and find cures to our diseases. So, uh, I, um, the animal is being used, and we talk about human treatment. It is by no means uh, a, a, a pleasant uh, situation at all when one induces uh, lung uh, respiratory distress. Uh, oh, uh, just before the interruption, what I was saying is that we will be talking about different kinds of uh, a plethora of pulmonary ailments, um, uh, allergic um, asthma, and then rhinitis, and then um, uh, ARDS, and um, IPF, um, so different kinds of lung diseases also in the in the previous slide, what I was saying, affect different parts of the respiratory tree. So some of it uh, uh, affects the um, nasal cavity, the upper respiratory tract, the rhinitis, which is now an excellent area for the SARS-CoV-2 to, uh, to enter, and then some of it uh, infects the bronchioles and the bronchiolar lobes, 
and then some of it deep inside the lung, the lower respiratory tract and the alveoli. Uh, and the interstitium, which is washed in the bronchial alveolar lavage, then forms an important uh, part, uh, important uh, clinical criterion to diagnose the disease. So why I'm saying all that, that is that uh, while we use animals for our, uh, and these are called preclinical models, while we use these different animals to understand, uh, to simulate and understand what goes on in the human lung, which probably goes on in the human lung under disease conditions, there are degrees of difference. Uh, however, um, uh, you know, the, the selfish animals that we are, uh, we use these other creatures. So with humility and with uh, gratitude, I would uh, talk about the mouse and its lung. Uh, so it has two lungs. The right lung has four lobes, uh, superior, middle, inferior, and post cavernal lobes. And the left lung has a single lobe. Uh, unlike humans, the lungs are part of the respiratory tract. It begins at the trachea, branches into the bronchi, bronchioles, and ends in the alveoli. Uh, but um, uh, there are differences that we will see in the subsequent slides. Uh, mouse lungs uh, have very thin respiratory epithelium and relatively large airway and lumen. And, uh, but they lack submucosal glands, but they have a high number of Clara cells. The Clara cells uh, are uh, responsible for generating ciliated squamous epithelial cells in the lung. Uh, they also have secretory functions. So uh, this comparison comes in because while we use the mouse for uh, preclinical research, uh, translation into humans often results in uh, duds, in, in other words, in useless uh, molecules. While they cure the lung asthma wonderfully when translated into humans, often they have been found to be not effective at all. So uh, this is the comparison. I will not go row by row in the in the table. I will give you a moment to look at the tables to just get an idea about uh, the extrapolation of the data from the mouse to the human lung. And while these are the dimensions, uh, by no means the complexity of the human uh, lung in terms of its cells and uh, non-cells uh, and the communicons uh, are exactly simil similar. So, uh, so while we simulate uh, respiratory diseases in the lung for um, discovering purposes, there are uh, certain uh, differences that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, here we talk about the cells of the airways and uh, this is in a bit to uh, introduce to you the sheer complexity of uh, what uh, one needs to study when one needs to look at the lung as a biological organ, a system, and as a part of the system that is uh, as a, a um, you know a nodal entity for the entire um, systemic um, um, stature of the human beings. Uh, that is uh, the, the uh, pulmonary circulation that um, uh, takes the oxygenated blood without which nothing will work. Uh, the pulmonary circulation is connected with the rest of the body. And uh, because of this connection uh, uh, and because of the highly vascularized nature of the lung, because it is the vasculature and the blood in the vasculature and the airway, uh, the uh, gas exchange between the airways and the blood is what makes uh, the lung such an important organ, just like the kidney, just like the skin, just like everything else. But the lung is special in the sense, whatever happens in the lung very quickly spreads systemically throughout the body. So uh, when you talk about respiratory illnesses, what makes COVID probably all the more terrifying is uh, not only the um, uh, you know the invisibility and the unpredictability of uh, the disease in the person, and there is an arm of the uh, inflammatory cascade, uh, immunological profile of the uh, person that is infected, um, and of course of the viral strain, but also of what this slide shows, in the sense that there is a large number of different kinds of cells. As I said, it is by no means homogeneous, but the degree of heterogeneity is quite large and therefore when we want to study the lung we want to study the targets that go on in the lung that control the different signaling cascades that make or break certain uh, phenomena um, that, that cause diseases or maintain health or resist diseases also so when we say cause diseases in the same breath we say resist diseases and the causing and the not causing is what makes the homeostasis somewhere in between so there is always that turnover, there is always that wear and tear, and there is always that 
uh, you know, fight and counter fight that is going on. And these are the cells which do it. As my cursor moves, you'll see that these are the different kinds of cells. And by no means, this slide is a, a, an oversimplification. Why we are talking about these cells? Because these are the cells that we have studied. So in the large airways and the small airways, there are the uh, ciliated uh, epithelial cells, the non-ciliated epithelial cells, the secretory cells, which are specialized cells. But these are all epithelial cells undergoing specialization for performing different functions. So when we go to the last part of the talk and we talk about regeneration, we talk about differentiation, induced differentiation, spontaneous differentiation, trans differentiation, de-differentiation, please always remember that while there are stem cells and stem cell niches with the pluripotent cells waiting to be differentiated into these different types of cells, it is absolutely necessary that the correct kind of cells are regenerated, teratoma formation is avoided, and while we look at this slide, we should also remember that one type of cell is um, uh, capable of differentiating into another given the right signals. So here we have the goblet cells uh, that produce the mucus and entraps the antigens. Entrapped antigens are eliminated by ciliary movement, which also has a secretory uh, part of it that makes the, uh, especially by the chloride ion flux that makes uh, the constant movement of the cilia um, uh, move the um, thing, the, the airway with the secretions and the boluses uh, of the congested materials, the pollutants that uh, they have gathered together, and those will have to be eliminated. So the elimination is not a random process. It is very much under the control of different secretory molecules under the uh, effect of sensors, little sensors that are located near the cilia. And uh, the basal membrane is also a very, very important part because the component of the basal membrane is what makes uh, these cells uh, differentiate into one form or the other. Moving on, the cells of the airways are um, the uh, main cells that we will be talking about. Uh, and like I said, when we talk about something, when we talk about signals, they are by no means the beyond and end all of what there is to know. And for the researchers out there, forming the questions based on what is now known is very important. So whatever I am saying is what we have covered in our work, but there are uh, still gaps in, in the uh, in our knowledge. So uh, the cells that we will be talking about um, in the course of this lecture is the type 1 and the other cells which are, uh, I wish we had uh, some of the ultrastructural diagrams here, unfortunately we don't. Um, so uh, the type 1 and the cells, they make up about 95% of the lung and they are the cells that are responsible for gas exchange. And these are like branched little uh, spidery uh, cells um, and uh, they, they, uh, the surface is important because it is through their surface that the gas exchange happens. The type 2 alveolar cells are the smaller cells. These are cuboidal cells and they make the pulmonary surfactant protein. And as you will see, they are also the putative stem cells and can transdifferentiate into type 1 alveolar cells. And they form about 5% of the uh, um, epithelial cells of the lung. There are the alveolar macrophages, and some of the work in the subsequent slides will show that we want to know about the crosstalk between the immune cells and the non-immune structural cells of the lung. There are the pulmonary neuroendocrine cells that have a function. We have uh, worked much on that. And of course, the surfactant layer that is uh, secreted by the type 2 and the other cells. There are the Clara cells that I um, explained, uh, that I introduced to you a um, little earlier on. So this is more or less the uh, how the lay of the land is and uh, the proximity of the air within the alveolus uh, and the blood which is in the uh, pulmonary circulation and it is uh, uh, separated by these two cells. So these are the alveolar uh, epithelial cells, these are the endothelial cells and the alveolar epithelial cells and the endothelial cells, they have to allow the gas exchange to happen. So the uh, duct junctions uh, in both these kinds of cells, when uh, the cells, when there is inflammation, the uh, cells from the blood would have to uh, migrate out and cause inflammation and vice versa. So this junction is something that we will remember for our uh, subsequent slides. And this junction is also where the putative stem cells are. So a lot is happening in that, uh, in that area. So uh, stem cells in the lung are um, 
we will uh, discuss about them later on. Uh, this is just to introduce that the neuroepithelial bodies of the NEBs in the bronchioles represent a clara cell secreted with protein expressing variant of clara cell. The bronchoalveolar duct junction represents a clara cell secreted with protein CCSP expressing variant of clara cell, which is CCSP plus pro SPC positive, which we will see later on. The putative stem cells are uh, also present in the intercartilaginous regions of the tracheobronchial airways. So in our um, studies to understand the lung, we will explore uh, in the subsequent uh, slides uh, the um, regions where the stem cell niches are, what their uh, status is during inflammation, and uh, in the immune cells, we will explore the regenerating cells or the stem cells uh, or the stem uh, functional cells um, uh, and how one leads to the other. So uh, this is an introductory slide. Quickly, we will go uh, into the uh, in, into certain definitions, uh, which defines how well your lung is doing. So uh, the uh, lung volumes and the lung capacities are the volumes of air in the lung at different uh, in the lungs at different phases of the respiratory cycle. So this is the tidal volume, the um, inspiratory. Um, uh, reserve volume, which is the maximum volume that can be inhaled from the end respiratory and inspiratory level, the expiratory volume, the residual volume, uh, the vital capacity, um, uh, which is the volume of air breathed out after the deepest inhalation, and the total lung capacity. Uh, these are important parameters because it also determines the state of health or disease, and that is how indirectly uh, it is measured. So uh, the parameters include the inspiratory capacity, which is the sum of the IRV and the tidal volume, the inspiratory vital capacity, which is the maximum volume of air inhaled from the point of maximum expiration, and so on and so forth. Uh, here, uh, your forced vital capacity. So when you hold something uh, near your mouth, or you hold uh, like a funnel inside your mouth, and you blow very hard. So when you do that, and then uh, air comes out forcibly ex, um, uh, expelled from the lung. So that is your forced expiratory volume. Uh, and it is a function of time, FEV1. So these are all important measurements, maximum inspiratory pressure and maximum expiratory pressure. Uh, and these are measurements from the biophysical point of view. Why? Because it tells you the state of being of that inflatable sac that basically your lung is. So we have been talking about the secretions, the signals, the cells, and a very dynamic living system of the lung. But ultimately, it has to have a very robust biophysical state of being. That is, it should not um, inflate more than a certain capacity, and it should not deflate beyond a certain capacity. So in the subsequent slides, we will, um, when we measure lung function, this is what we measure. And um, I think I went a little bit ahead of me. Uh, pulmonary function test involves complete a complete evaluation of the respiratory system of the person, and it is measured by spirometry, which is a measurement of the different uh, volumes and the capacity of the lung. And this is where the, this little box comes in, and this is measured by the spirometer. This is, however, what we use in our system because measurement of the functional capacity of the mouse lung is what we measure. And when I was talking about the inspiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, vital capacity, expiratory uh, inhibitory uh, in, uh, MIP um, uh, inhibitory pressure, uh, and insp inspirational pressure. What was that again? Sorry. Uh, inspiratory vital capacity and maximal inspiratory pressure and maximal expiratory pressure. So coming back. Again, let me explain that these are the two main um, units that we measure. That is when we, um, uh, there are two kinds of measurement. One is in the uh, conscious mouse, freely moving, which is called the whole body plethysmography. And one is in the supine uh, unconscious mouse, which is under ventilation. Uh, and one measures the airway resistance and the pulmonary compliance. So why I went back to the other slide is to explain that uh, when one, forcibly uh, makes the um, animal um, inhale or exhale, it should not be going beyond a certain um, um, 
range. Because if it does, uh, if it uh, offers extra resistance, that would mean your lung is stiff and rigid and probably it's fibrotic. And if it deflates more, that is if it complies, if it is more compliant than is necessary, that means the elasticity of the lung is not quite what it should be. And it uh, indicates a muscle dysfunction. And between these two, there is a, a dimensionless index to evaluate uh, pulmonary function. It is called the enhanced pause. And is that little bit of time between your inhalation and your exhalation. And it is measured by a formula and it is measured by a machine called the whole body, body plethysmograph, like I said. And um, sorry, I'm losing the cursor so that when you see a mad movement of the cursor, that means I've lost the cursor. And, I don't know where it is moving. And the RL and C uh, measure, uh, are measured by the uh, invasive technique. So uh, these are the um, um, sort of, there's an ongoing debate on whether uh, penage or whether pulmonary compliance reliance uh, resistance is the ideal way to go. Um, but one does a compromise between the two and uh, in the subsequent slides when I share the data you will see that there's data from both. However, we must remember uh, that uh, the mouse lung has differences with the human lung. So the extrapolation is always done with a bit of caution. Why mice are used? Because it is uh, they are uh, easier to handle. We will see in the subsequent slides, and we will talk about that then. So this, these are the types of plethysmographs, and there are pros and cons, like I said. And um, this is what the uh, different volumes are. And uh, again, we come back to the MIP and the MEP, and uh, that tells you whether you have COPD or IPF or any other form of uh, lung ailment. Uh, yeah, so this is the slide that we um, uh, talk about, and then we go to the data. So we use mice because there are a lot of knockout models of mice that allows us to understand the role play. We understand how the lung um, um, senses damage and uh, stress, how the lung repairs uh, those damages to understand the roles. It is easier to generate knockout mice. Um, however, the sheep and the dog lung is closer to the human lung, which is why they are used for drug development. That is the formulation part where uh, the discovered uh, drugs, the novel drug entities uh, that are formulated uh, with a number of permutations and combinations to form just the right formulation that will work uh, in uh, terms of efficacy and uh, low side effects. So uh, some of it is that um, the disadvantages, there is a difference in the lung structure, as we saw in some of the initial slides. They do not develop disease symptoms similar to humans. They do not develop spontaneous asthma like we do. Uh, we have to give methacolin challenge uh, to, to generate the airway hyperresponsiveness typical to humans. Um, however, sheep are uneconomical. They are large animals. Uh, the disease progression is poorly understood. Like I said, the mouse is very uh, well studied and easy to handle and cost effective. Uh, and uh, so also for the dog, however, the dog has a cough reflex. Uh, dog specific reagents like the uh, ovine specific reagents are um, not as easily available and high uh, housing costs. So, uh, you know, every time I go through such things, uh, one cannot but, um, you know, feel apologetic about human arrogance. But anyway, there you have it. Uh, so this is now the data. We will be talking a lot, a lot about the data. And I uh, beg for your uh, patience because some of you may be watching through uh, phones and you may find it a little difficult to read through all the little graphs and figures that will come in the subsequent slides. However, I will try and explain it as best as I can. So there are a number of lung diseases. Most of it is manifested with a shortness of breath, difficulty to breathe, uh, differences in all those volume definitions that we uh, read earlier on, um, uneasiness, uh, and other symptoms. However, the etiology, the positive um, um, story behind uh, the, the particular disease that is causing your 
uh, form of distress must be understood first. Why? Because if uh, the target cell is T cell and you take, um, you know, something against macrophages, which is uh, specific for, say, emphysema or COPD, your asthma is not only going to get worse, you are spending on healthcare, uh, it is toxic, it is inefficacious, uh, and it is just pointless. So for diagnostic purposes, for therapeutic purposes, and for prophylactic purposes. So prophylaxis is to preempt something, therapeutic is after the disease onset has begun, and diagnostic is to understand what particular uh, pulmonary disease you have. And that is very, very important to understand because then your drug target, your management of the disease is going to be quite different. So the ones that we shall talk about is acute asthma, which is a short-term asthma and results in inflammation, chronic asthma, which is a long-term asthma and more like the human disease, where along with the inflammation, there is air, airway remodeling, idiopathic, that means um, uh, reason unknown, pulmonary fibrosis, deposition of uh, fibrotic proteins and rigidity. There is the chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, which is much like the cigarette-induced emphysema, and the allergic rhinitis, which is a physical phenomenon, uh, which is a similar phenomenon. And we have shortly uh, when um, uh, you will uh, have uh, high pollen content in the air because many of the trees and uh, will be flowering and um, contain which are allergens of uh, high potency. So uh, today we will be talking about these three clinical models and this is the um, uh, disease regimen. In the interest of time, I will be explaining the disease regimen in some detail here because then we will be going into the data and without it, it will, you will find it difficult to understand. So there are two main uh, phases of the onset of the disease in mouse. One is the sensitization phase where you prime the um, allergen uh, in the uh, uh, systemically, in peri peritoneally, and then later on, one challenges it with uh, different degrees of uh, allergen in decreasing concentrations to tease the in situ tissue uh, into becoming asthmatic. So uh, in the intraperitoneal or the sensitization phase, it is putting the memory in the B cells because when, it, when the uh, asthma circuit actually starts is when um, there is allergen in the uh, atmosphere, allergen that is taken in by the antigen presentation cells, which are the dendritic cells and the macrophages. They present the, cell, uh, the, the allergen in a, a, an allergen to the T cells, which are the naive T cells knowing nothing. And then they become H2 cells now secreting H2 specific cytokines that you will be. Using. And these uh, T cells present to the B cells, which now secrete the allergen specific IgE. The allergen specific IgE goes and cross links with the mast cells, and the mast cells degranulate to release histamines that that causes the inflammation, the respiratory irritation, the airway hyperresponsiveness, and this in a chronic form, that means again and again and again, leads to airway modeling, where the annular epithelial cells and the macrophages play a big role, but here, as you see, the T cells play a big role. What we will be talking about right now are the GP91 FOX subunit of NADPH oxidase, its role. We will be talking about the alpha-4 integrin in VLA-4, very late antigen-4, its role. The two integrins, the V and the vascular sanitation molecule, its role. The three selectines, endothelial, uh, lymphocytes, can platelet derived their role. And we will be talking about uh, uh, these roles in uh, various permutation combinations with other molecules such as MP12, uh, uh, the alpha 4 and beta 2 uh, double knockout, um, and uh, GP91 Fox single knockout, and GP91 Fox MMP12 double knockout mouse. Mice. Uh, so uh, these will determine the key molecules. So the talk of the the title of the talk that says repairing the lung. So what is it that caused the lung to develop the asthma or not? 
So the aim of the study, uh, as is evident, is to determine the role of such molecules. Very briefly, GP91 FOX is uh, the membranous component of phagocytic energy pH oxidase, which contains the cofactors required for electron transfer reaction and is responsible for complexing the two non identical heme groups of the energy pH oxidase via two histidine pairs, as you can see here. And first, the electrons are transferred from energy pH uh, onto FAD and then to the heme group and in the second step to reduce oxygen to superoxide anion in a one electron transfer reaction. That's in a very, very nutshell. So there are different components that are uh, separately present in the cytosol or in the inner the cytosolic phase of the membrane and then they come together uh, when the concentration of uh, factors that bring them together are right. Uh, when the, in the resting phase, uh, um, when the conditions are right, then they are active and this is more or less the function that they perform. The beta-2 integrin structural activation on surface T-cells is essential for binding the intracellular addition molecule ligand present on the leukocytes. Now, the leukocytes which are uh, undergoing a rapid uh, movement, uh, you know, like a discus, it flows smoothly through blood, but when there are inflammatory signals, they have to settle down, so they slow down they settle down on the endothelial cells and to settle down on the endothelial cells, just like the uh, aeroplanes will have to put down their wheels, they express the integrins and these integrin receptors are specific for ligands expressed on the endothelial uh, cells, which are the vascular lining. And so the cells, the lymphocytes, they uh, change from a resting phase to an active phase because now they have to sense other uh, um, um, stimuli in order to perform their business and uh, uh, such sensing is facilitated by these molecules. The alpha-4 beta-1 integrin also interacts with the BCAM and is essential for T-cell APC interaction and for GP91 FOX activation. So somewhere the entire system comes together and we try to uh, understand their role, delineate their role in acute allergic asthma. Integrin structural activation, proper chemokine response from uh, antigen presentation cells such as the macrophages and consequent clustering of integrins play a role in T-cell APC addition reaction during inflammatory conditions. And this is sort of the summary of the inside-out signaling whereby uh, all these uh, molecules have to be um, right where they are required, right in the state in which they are required to perform the downstream functions, which are, if there is weak adhesion, there is no T-cell uh, response, the signals delivered by chemokines and antigen recognition act on the integrins, and clustering and increase in affinity of integrins leads to strong T-cell APC adhesion and to T-cell response. So why we are saying all this? Because we want to see if they have a role in causing asthma. So if they need to, they are needed to complete the circuits to cause the allergic inflammation or they keep uh, the lid on it. That is, they have a regulatory function. So, and these are the el elastins that uh, we talked about earlier, and they are also uh, similar in role to integrins. Um, uh, one is expressed on the leukocytes, another on the endothelial cells, and another on the platelets. So, uh, the hematopoietic cell movement uh, is much dependent on these molecules. So this is the um, uh, regimen of uh, of causing uh, of of generating the the model uh, on day zero of the treatment. There is over and which is given with an adjunct, uh, and then on day eight to uh, twenty one, uh, intratracheal over is given. It could be nebulized or it could be intratracheally instilled behind the tongue. And these are uh, highly skilled jobs that are done. The animals use are the symbols that we use. This is the one that over alum in the placebo. The NOX is the GP91 single knockout, and DAO is the GP91 uh, MMP12 double knockout mice. And uh, in, in, in uh, the ELP knockout, we call them EKO and EO. Uh, these are triple knockout mice. And in the alpha-4 FF, which is the um, the alpha-4 flocks animals were uh, in uh, were crossbred with the MX3 mice, 
and uh, with the injection of poly I poly C, interferon alpha was released, which deleted uh, the alpha 4 gene uh, from uh, all hematopoietic tissue. More than 98% deletion, only those mice were taken. And uh, beta 2, uh, however, was um, uh, there is a type of here, this is going to be beta 2, not beta 4. Uh, and the beta 2 was a knockout, and this was an embryonic knockout. Uh, whereas the alpha 4 is embryonic lethal, so uh, only the alpha 4 uh, gene in the adult after the thymic maturation, everything is there, all the lymphocytes are in place, uh, the uh, deletion was happening. So there is a difference between the deleted and the knockout mouse, and the knockout mouse never had the gene. So by knocking out these uh, creatures, uh, these molecules, we want to see if these creatures, the mice, the knockout mice, would respond to OVA to generate the asthmatic model. Okay, so um, uh, uh, a lot of data. I will explain the first slide, uh, but I, I see time is running out. So suffice it to say that in the airway resistance uh, compliance model, uh, the alpha-4 knockout mice uh, show um, this is one, this is, uh, which one is this? This is the GP91 fox mice. The GP91 fox mice show exaggerated symptoms of asthma. That means it has a regulatory role. These are the total number of cells that migrated there. This is the clonogenic potential of the progenitors. These are the over-specific um, immunoglobulins, and these are the cytokine uh, levels. And uh, similarly, um, the NOX1 one, uh, one mice and the double knockout mice show exaggerated symptoms. In the study 2, alpha 4, uh, however, uh, show, um, okay, I'm a little lost here. No, this is again GP91 fox. Okay. So, study 2 is actually the study of T cells, the role of T cells in the um, NOX O um, uh, mouse, that is the GP91 fox knockout treated with COVA. Uh, mouse and uh, various learning molecules were studied here. This is mixed lymphocytic reaction to show the uh, to see the responder versus the stimulant curve of the APC presentation to the T cells. Inhibition of oxidative burst response, which is a functional response of the myeloid cells. Inhibition of macrophage chemotactic factor uh, one driven chemotaxis, whether they are functionally active, and the differential alteration of MHC2 and co stimulatory molecules in the knock, uh, knockout bronchoalveolar Lavage cells. Okay, uh, this is um, a study three, which is with the alpha-4 knockout. And the alpha-4 uh, knockout shows uh, an um, uh, down modulation. Uh, so the red is the down modulation. So this is the wild type mouse. And the down modulation means that they are required versus the GP19 one fox, which are regulatory. So how are they required? This is the Vikram one, which shows a similar phenotype with the alpha four and beta two. That means it is required. That means when you knock it out, um, alpha despite over um, asthma generation, um, the phenotype of the disease is not required. That means it is required for the. Um, circuit completion for the allergic inflammation to occur. Okay, again, very small symbols, and it is difficult for me to um, read, but um, uh, you can understand if I, uh, if you follow my cursor that these are the wild-type uh, over-treated mouse um, on the pH value. Uh, no, this is RN value, that is airway resistance, versus the triple uh, selecting knockout mice, which show very, very low uh, airway resistance. That means it fails to develop the allergic asthma. So these are the inferences which in a nutshell GP91 FOX and MNP12 are regulatory in function whereas the integrins are needed to A prime during sensitization, B in use migration and in a chronic form they uh, act in a non-redundant manner. So in the acute um, model Alpha 4 and beta 2 are both needed to complete the cycle. Uh, and in uh, chronic, however, alpha 4 is needed, but beta 2 is not needed. So you see the disease phenotype is very different, and the roles of the molecules are also very different in space with time. So uh, the next study was done with the therapy with physetine. 
Quisitin is a natural product. It is, it is a polyphenol uh, flavonoid compound uh, that is known to have antioxidative, anti-inflammatory functions, but nobody had studied it in the mice, and we wanted to see if um, it could be uh, a replacement for current therapy, which is by no means a foolproof therapy, and there are unmade changes there. And uh, while the long-acting and short-acting beta agonists and corticosteroids um, give temporary relief, there are many patients which are who are refractory to it. So we wanted to look for um, something which is natural, something which is efficacious, and something which has less side effects. So these are the experimental design, and 50 nanomolar physetian orally was given one hour before the uh, intratracheal treatment. And uh, it significantly reduced the inflammation caused by ova. Uh, these are the uh, uh, how uh, it does. So this slide shows, does it do it? Does physetian really help? And this is, if it does, then how does it do it? And uh, this is uh, more or less the uh, inference that we draw that um, uh, while OVA uh, acts to teach to activation and activation and nuclear localization of NF-kappa B, INOS, STAT-6, HIF-1-alpha, IL-4, and IL-13, overproduction leads to asthma. And this is where physetin uh, seems to be inhibiting. And um, uh, we carried on the work with other molecules with um, RNA uh, silencing by SMAD-7 and GATA3, and this work is in progress, and this is unpublished, so uh, we decided not to share it anyway. It's a long lecture tonight. Uh, so uh, in the chronic asthma model, what I was saying, and 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 this is the this is the story that I will tell you, that the chronic asthma with physetin and curcumin, and this is the work of Promoto, and he's about to submit his thesis. So in our rationale, um, and this is the experimental design, and the red uh, arrows show 50 nanomolar of isotin and 50 nanomolar of curcumin given orally, and it's significantly reduced, significantly reduced, and this is where probably it works, and this is where probably curcumin works. But uh, we know that the uh, bioavailability of curcumin is slightly low, so we also work with other vehicles such as the mesoporous carbon nanoparticles, but I don't think we, uh, we talked about that here. So uh, this is uh, what we uh, talked about in uh, the, this is the last part of the talk, and this is where we talk about uh, respiratory disease, which is the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, where we also work with the physetin and the curcumin, and this is the experimental design point um, in seven and the male of Leo was given intratracheally and intranasally, and on day seven and day fourteen there was high inflammation. But on by day twenty-eight, uh, I think this is not day twenty-one, but it is probably day twenty-eight, uh, and uh, it was sacrificed. And uh, cellular infiltration, clonogenic potential of the lung, the cytokine, and the collagen deposition. Because here we are looking at the airway remodeling versus the uh, T cell activation in the earlier model. So here. Uh, it reduced the inflammation caused by these are um, made by the same uh, as the degree of hydrosis and CFU, which is the uh, in the lung, which goes down significantly in this light blue, which is a bio treated one, and goes up with the physical treatment with curcumin treatment, and um, it has um, a role. Now, this is the last part I see. I probably have maybe five more minutes, so if uh, the host will kindly allow me 10 more minutes, I will finish it. Um, uh, so uh, the rationale of the stem cell therapy is that, so we talked about the inflammation part to degenerate and which leads to depletion, the stem cell reservoir. There's always a degree of we are is and the uh, um, um, uh, tissue is unable to regenerate the lost part, then it progressively be a degenerate state. And our rationale was using the human embryonic stem cells, the human umbilical or derived mesenchymal stem cells. Stem cells. Other work with adipose derived stem cells 
uh, are also on and amniotic utilizing the lab. So healthy factors, that is growth factors, the um, patients by other cells, hypoxia or hypoxia pericellularly, uh, the temperature and the cell density all play into the differentiation of the lung. And we basically wanted to see through a tissue engineering format whether the lung is able to, da to repair its damage uh, following this kind of uh, degeneration. So this is a tissue-based therapy, cell-based therapy that is used. And we here talk about the 8-7 HESCs, which are used to repair the AE1 cells, which are lost in um, degeneration. So the AE2, the alveolar epithelial type 2, which are the putative stem cells, um, uh, the ones that we are looking at, the Clara cells that give rise to the ciliated uh, epithelial cell. So the non ciliated squamous epithelial cell is what we wanted to uh, see that it could grow. And for that, we use um, culture uh, media, small areas growth medium, and uh, Ronka and endothelial growth medium. Along with it, we also use ICG001, which is an inhibitor of the WNT beta catenin pathway to see whether what it does. So um, we used again the biomycin model, and here you can see that uh, proprietorial tissue engineering techniques uh, turned the 87 cells into embryo bodies, which were within uh, 10 days of formation. Uh, showed this is the SPC positive, which is um, a marker of the alveolar epithelial two cells, and uh, th these are the uh, real time PCR uh, data, and this is the uh, cell data, um, uh, protein data from facts. And these are the BEGM treated, and these are the Clara cells, which are CC10 positive cells, and the alveolar epithelial type two are the SPC positive cells, and alveolar epithelial cell one are marked by the aquaporin 5 cells. So whether the cells that we made, and there was a very nice picture, the ultrastructure that shows uh, the uh, anterior epithelial type 2 cells have very nice um, um, uh, whorl-like uh, little um, intracellular granules to uh, show that these are the anterior epithelial type 2 cells generating the SPC, the surfactant proteins. And when uh, the human fetus is ready for birth, uh, so long it was getting its, oxy its oxygen from the mother's placenta, when it is ready to take birth and have an aerial existence, it, uh, a series of inflammation at the umbilical, uh, in the placenta um, is initiated uh, only when the surfactant protein C is maturing in the lung, and therefore only with the SPC, first the SPC, C, then A, then C, only when it matures and the lung is ready to burst out of the mother's amniotic fluid and directly breathe air. That is when uh, the human baby is re ready to take birth. So uh, this um, model was um, uh, used in a xenograft transplantation model in a um, rag 2 gamma C knockout mouse uh, to see that uh, whether the cells that we had generated uh, from these um, um, experiments could actually be transplanted into the lung. These uh, RAG2 gamma C knockout mice do not have the T cells and the B cells. And um, uh, they um, showed transplantation, that means we could actually detect the presence of T cells in the lung, and it led to um, rescue of um, uh, inflammation and degeneration. Uh, uh, the reason why it happened may be the cells themselves. We did not follow it for very long. We followed it till day 28, I think. But uh, it could also be because of paracrine modulation, which we will see in some of our other works, such as with the umbilical cord derived mesenchymal cells. And this is the data. And the uh, mouse bone cells. And uh, this showed uh, in um, uh, uh, data that there was. Uh, reduction of inflammation and degeneration. Now, whether it happened because of uh, anti inflammatory modulation by paracrine secretion of the cells or by the cells themselves undergoing trans differentiation is not known. Uh, probably in the ESC, it is the trans differentiation uh, and the differentiation, but in this case, probably it is because of other secretion, but we have not uh, checked that. So, other work uh, that we did uh, is uh, that we are doing is with KIND 1. Uh, unfortunately, it's almost ready for communication, but because of the lockdown, uh, I think a number of the data uh, is a little bit 
um, you know, on hold. So uh, the last part that we will talk about in the next few minutes is stem cell niches. So stem cell niches is what we are looking for um, to understand the distribution of stem cell niches because okay, on the distribution of the pockets of these reservoirs of progenitors, because when the movement here is ongoing, of course, these guys, these pockets have to have, be very kosher like bank walls, and they must uh, house these cells in an undifferentiated, uh, unproliferative state, only ready to proliferate and differentiate when there is a need. So the regulation of the stems and niche is very, very important. We used to um, uh, technique, short-term technique, where you are three, 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 two, two die, air flux. And one is the long-term technique we use when we use the pulse chase uh, model using the um, BRDU. So uh, for after 10 weeks of chase, we find and we used it in the NOX uh, knockout and the double knockout mice. And we see that uh, there was an enhanced uh, fibrosis in the um, NOX leomycin. This is NOX O was the OVA, and NOX P is the leomycin induced mouse. And uh, Leo treated uh, treatment for depletion of lung stem cell niche, which were not able to recover. And Leo um, did the BRDU positive for an decrease for the hours after Leo treatment. So um, we characterized the uh, cells, um, the nature of the progenitors from the cells, uh, and this is an ongoing work. So, in conclusion, uh, what I have uh, shared today is a translation of. Um, of knowledge from basic research in understanding the molecules involved in inflammation, in acute and chronic inflammation, in allergic inflammation, in the lower respiratory tree and in the upper respiratory tree. We have not uh, uh, shared the study today. Uh, uh, using various knockout models to understand the rules of different molecules, how they cooperate with each other, the sequence of uh, treatment, and the sequence of signaling, uh, the uh, presentation, the directionality of presentation from the T cells to the APC, and um, of course, especially the um, uh, GP91 Fox uh, model is very, very interesting, especially in the T cell study portion. But it's all clubbed together in study one, two, three, four. So uh, probably I have not done justice to the work. But basically, this is what we do to translate the work from here to uh, develop uh, therapeutic molecules. Uh, for uh, drug targeting and or management of the disease. So uh, these are my current members and um, much of the work that I have uh, discussed today are also from my previous uh, members. Um, um, so Deborah and Angie and Shay and um, Betty and Greg. Um, and uh, the pictures are not here, but uh, they are also members of, they were also members of the team who had contributed to the work. And here is Promotho. Promotho is going to submit his piece very soon. Uh, this is Nondita, this is Shinjini who uh, made the slide. This is Obishek who has done thorough reading of the slide. And I say that when I was doing the work uh, in uh, at the University of Washington, I did not know that after uh, so many years, I will get such excellent students who will revisit the work and carry it forward. There's Ronita, who's working on pawn extract, um, um, uh, Payal, who is working on regeneration, and, uh, and she's working on Tenaria also as a model. Uh, a lot of the work that is described today, Ronita's work I did not describe with the SMAD and the Gata work, which is unpublished, and uh, Promotho has done some uh, work in acute and chronic model of asthma, and Shinjini has also done some seminal work with the um, uh, stem cell in tissue uh, engineering um, in the um, damaged lung. So uh, I must thank uh, all the funding agencies, without whom we don't much uh, get to do uh, anything, and that completes my today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Banerjee, for uh, such an informative session. Uh, so we are running out of time. Uh, so today we cannot take uh, many questions. 
Uh, I'll take a couple of questions. Uh, one question from uh, Gargi Dutta. Uh, she's asking, uh, does smoking affect alveolar macrophages? And also, uh, will the chain smoker will be affected more by COVID-19 or not? Okay, that's a bit of a guesswork. But yes, alveolar macrophages are damaged. Alveolar macrophages go into a hyperactive mode, and that's not good for you. So uh, they are damaged, and um, I do not know if they will uh, be affected more. But definitely there is an element of comorbidity. So anything that could have fought the virus, uh, part of the innate immune network, if it is damaged, uh, along with the extensive airway damage uh, that the macrophages and alveolar epithelial cells will also doubtless sustain in the chronic uh, smoker, uh, well, God help him. Another question we got from uh, uh, Shubhash Kanti Roy. Uh, he's asking how extreme cold affect uh, lung cell causing asthma or pneumonia. Uh, okay, this is kind of complex. Extreme cold by itself is definitely an environmental stressor, but along with it, there has to be other downstream processes that would affect uh, the signaling. So, uh, A, there is a stressor element of just the cold. B, there would be opportunistic microbes who would be, um, you know, willing to get into the, uh, into the upper and the lower respiratory tract. Having said that, we are also interested to understand how the commensals that um, uh, inha uh, inhabit our upper and lower respiratory tracts and for that matter, other parts of the, of the body also help in the innate immune response. So to answer your question very, very briefly, and I will by no means do justice to the question. It's very, very complex. So A, the stressor of the cold. B, the organisms that will take advantage of that stressed condition, such as chlamydia and uh, you know pneumonia, all these other things will also probably get an entry. And if the immune uh, network is downmodulated uh, because of this compromise, then of course the uh, defense mechanism will also likely go down. Okay. Uh, let me take a few more questions. Um, uh, one is uh, from Minakshi Majumdar. Uh, she is asking, what is the chance of acceptability of this stem cell by the immune system of the body? I don't know. Uh, I mean, is this clear? Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, if uh, this is uh, stem cell from your own body, because uh, you know, from the uh, from the sternum or from the back, from the base of your spinal cord, one can take out the um, uh, the bone marrow, and if it, it is given to you, or if your uh, you know cord blood is preserved somewhere, or there are other sources of cell. The embryonic stem cell is is kind of good because uh, it has less of the immune markers in it. But having said that, there is a chance of uh, graft rejection, just like in any other kind of transplantation. But uh, for the stem cells coming from your own source, and of course, when one gives you the stem cells, uh, you are um, treated as a recipient uh, to be less uh, responsive. So there are suppressive immunosuppressive agents that you will have to take. So there is always a compromise. Uh, so uh, what we uh, wanted to show here is that the cells get there, number one, then the cells settle down there in the injured tissue, where your injured tissue itself acts as an axis to sort of direct them there. And then when they settle down there, they must actually form grafts. So that true engraftment is very, very necessary. Now, immune cells, uh, immune system definitely kicks in at that point. Now, some of it, like we saw in the MSCs, has anti-inflammatory effects. So while uh, it is a, uh, you know, um, something that you're introducing extraneously, at the same time, they also have these paracrine effects in which they calm down the surrounding tissues. So stem cells have a better chance of engraftment than others, I would think. But yes, there's always the element of risk and teratoma formation. Okay. Thank you, man. Uh, another question from uh, Sujoy Sarkar. Uh, he's asking how COPD uh, damage cell level of lungs? Uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, it is an obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, macrophages are the main players in the, um, in the destruction. 
uh, the downstream, so that's the immune component, and there is the non-immune component, that is the non-hematopoietic, the tissue damage happens at the alveolar epithelial type uh, 2 and type 1. But at the same time, Shushmita, could you please? Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, uh, with the damage, uh, there is also obstruction in the sense there is a load of secretion that uh, makes little bonuses and there is the damage in the chloride flux which means that the interstitial cells do not allow the smooth passage of all these congested materials. So uh, what was the question Sundaram again? Yeah, so uh, he's asking uh, how COPD damage the cell level of lungs. They damage the cell level. So damage. A, what I, what I just uh, explained, B, when it obstructs the airflow, of course, there is a compromise in getting the nutrition, getting the oxygen, and there is apoptosis, there is damage. And then with the inflammation, since you are not able to get something out, you will secrete it more and more and you'll get agitated. And with the agitation, the chronic inflammation sets in. So the, uh, the especially the pseudoepithelial, the glandular epithelium is very badly damaged. So when it gets messy and all kinds of, uh, you know, confusing signals are coming in, your system tends to go into an overdrive. So the overdrive causes a, a kind of proliferation of the wrong cells with the wrong kind of activities because you are going into an offensive mode. With that, there is universal destruction in just about every kind of cell of the body. So A, there is inflammation, B, there is destruction, C, there is degeneration because the cells that could have regenerated and given you back the new tissue are also damaged in the hyperinflammatory state. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, would you mind if I take another more, one more question? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so this is from uh, from uh, Sanjari Godai. She's asking in case of small airway, which cell is responsible for trapping antigen? Uh, in case of small airways, the Clara cells are responsible for trapping antigen. So Clara cells are the one that sell, secrete the CCSP and uh, they are the CC10 markers. And these also give rise to the ciliated epithelium. So they are the guys to look out for. Okay. Just another one in line with uh, this question. Is Clarisels also present in humans too? If yes, what is the function? Huh, same function. So Clarisels are present in the humans. Uh, they are present along with the AE2. Uh, they are present in patches near the small, especially the small airways. And uh, this is what their function is. So they have the secretory function, they have the sensory function, as well as uh, they have some degree of trans differentiation functions to regenerate the ciliated, the damaged ciliated epithelial cells. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again uh, for answering all these questions. I think everyone is happy uh, to know the answers, whatever the, their doubts were. Uh, with this, uh, today I'll, I'll, I'll conclude this session. Again, thanks a lot, Professor Banerjee, for enlightening us with such a wonderful talk and informative session. And thank you all, all the audiences for, for joining here. And with this, uh, I have one announcement for a special lectures, uh, lecture on, on uh, coming Saturday, which is uh, on Gateway of Inflammation and Pathogenesis by uh, Barsanjit Majumdar uh, from Cleveland State University, USA. With this, I'll si we will sign off and, and thank you again. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Bye-bye.